Hey, what's up, everyone? This is Caleb, and I'm here with my homie, Josh. Yes. And he's a computer technician. I'm a software guy, and we thought maybe we could come together and make something good for the YouTube. We thought we could, but we'll see how it goes. <laughs> so the, the goal here is to talk about the key hardware components that every software developer should know and understand to some extent. But before we get started, check out our sponsor. This is the part where you edit in the full sponsor thing. You don't <laughs> leave it like this. <laughs> Thinkful should be your go-to resource for securing a job in tech. The thing about Thinkful is that they succeed when you succeed. It's their job to get you a position in software engineering, data science, data analytics, product design, or product management. Whatever your goal might be, Thinkful is there to guide you through the process beginning to end. So go look at their courses and see if one fits your needs. The great thing here is that you get a position in tech or you get your tuition back. So there's no risk to going through Thinkful. Check them out, I'll leave a link in the description. So fortunately, as you've explained to me thousands of times, computers work as a black box. You don't have to understand the internals, but it can help. Yes. For many people, it's just plug it in and it works. It works for years and we never really second guess it. But as you are a software developer and you start to write programs, it becomes important to understand what's in the black box. So after you understand the basics of hardware, you can learn in, in more detail and this allows you to build applications that are either super specialized to run super fast on particular hardware or it allows you to build applications that are more general, able to run on all hardware types. So for the big picture, everything attaches to the motherboard. The motherboard is just kind of a connect all, this goes in here, this goes on this, this goes on this, everything goes in it. And But before we get to really get and talk about that, first thing we're gonna get into is the CPU. processor. Sorry. The CPU, the processor, processor. it doesn't Same matter thing. what you call it. <laughs> it is the core component in your computer that does math, it does any kind of calculations, it does any kind of jump to, it, do, it executes code, runs programs, runs operating systems. Sounds like it does everything. And it is the central <laughs> processing unit, yes. Which isn't to say that there's, you know, there is others, but this is the important one. You can't really have the computer system working without this. So a few things about processors to kind of get into. They're a tiny little silicon chip, plugs in your computer. Uh, they are primarily made by Intel and AMD. They're gonna make most desktop ones. Did, is, it, is that where they came up with the name Silicon Valley? Cause it's like the computing area? Yes. Dude, I didn't know that. So Intel and AMD make them. Intel has their well-known Intel Core i series which has been around for years. AMD's come out with this Ryzen series, which has been around for a few years. These are the processors that are aimed at the consumer. There is higher performance ones, like AMD has Threadripper and Epic processors, EPYC, and Intel has Xeon processors, which are amazing and cost as much as a small house. <laughs> and then there's some uh, more, you know, we're kind of going to the uh, cheaper electronics, so there's like the Intel Pentium, the Intel Acceleron. Um, we can go over to the AMD Athlon series. So what are those used for? This is used for lightweight computing. So if you just have nodes that are connecting to a software as a service application, um, you don't need to run the whole thing very well. So like a Chromebook maybe? Yes, actually a Chromebook is a very good example. So the last part is RISC processors which sounds pretty risky, but it just stands for Reduced Instruction Set Computing. It okay. means you don't have to have a full-featured CPU die to get stuff done. Where would something like this be used? On your mobile phones. Your mobile phones, in your calculators, in pretty much anything that isn't a full-fledged desktop that still does math. You could think set-top boxes, wireless routers, um, certain network switches. Little smart devices yeah, and stuff. Yeah, if anything is like talking to Amazon or if they're um, part of this whole internet of things, then they probably have a RISC processor. Something that's cheap, affordable, doesn't use a lot of power, can be put nearly anywhere. Next up, we have the memory or RAM. RAM is legitness. RAM is where your programs are loaded into. So 
whenever you start up your computer and your program your computer starts loading up the operating system google chrome it all gets fed into ram so ram is what's known as volatile memory meaning that when you shut your computer down everything in ram disappears and when you start your computer back up all the, the new programs will then be loaded into RAM again. There's also different generations of RAM, also processors, which we didn't really touch on, but every time there's a new generation, there are numerous improvements. There, so, there are big improvements, and I'm gonna interrupt you here. <laughs> there are big improvements. Um, we can transfer more at once from the CPU to RAM to back and forth. Um, we can hold more per chip. So the RAM is just a series of chips, and when we double that density, we can hold more and have a higher capacity. RAM comes in different form factors. So you got like a longer desktop RAM and then you got like short laptop RAM. And then there's also specialty kinds that go on graphics cards. So if you've ever heard of GDDR5 RAM, basically they're a special memory designed for graphics cards that allow it to transfer a huge amount of data at once. So that is what we call volatile storage because it disappears when your computer shuts down. There's also non-volatile storage, which is a little bit more permanent. And this would be your hard drive or your solid state drive. So this is where you would store information in a database. It's all going to be stored on your hard drive. This is where your files are. This is where your photos are. Everything that needs to exist after you turn off your computer and turn it back on goes in the hard drive. Storage has come a long way. I remember starting out with floppy disk, um, then we moved on to hard disk drives, which is like a mechanical spinny disk thing. <laughs> it's really, to sum it up, that's what it is. And now we've moved on to this generation of solid state drives, which is just a series of chips that are talking and you can, you can say save this data to the, to the chips and it does it. Um, is that how that works? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> of course that's how it works. Um, it's abstracted to the highest level. We've also moved on to a kind of a, a subset of this technology called um, M.2 over the NVMe drive, over the PCI Express lanes. Basically to say, we have blazing fast storage solutions now. Yeah. And this can be internal or it can be external. Yes. So you're gonna have an internal drive which you, you store most of your stuff on, but you can also get this stuff external, as you guys probably know. So buy this link in the description. No, I'm just kidding. But seriously, link in the description. So this is a, an external M.2 drive, uh, two terabytes, so they get pretty dang high now. They do, and it's very fast. Uh, you're talking like transferring. I think this one said it goes up to like a thousand megabytes a second. So next up, we're gonna talk about the graphics card or the graphics component if you don't have a dedicated card. Yes. Or a, a discrete graphics card. Discrete graphics card, that is the, uh, see you later, bye. So there's kind of two categories here. You can have discrete graphics, which would be a graphics card, and then you can have embedded graphics, which would be part of the, the processor or the, the motherboard, correct? Yes. Is that it? <laughs> I mean, yeah, that's pretty much it. All right, um, so the, the graphics card is going to be used for graphically intense tasks. So if you're doing any kind of like 3D modeling or game development or video editing or uh, I can't think of anything else, VR stuff, that's probably going to be using the graphics card. So we'll start with embedded. Um, not, not every system is going to be a high dollar. We've got to put a NVIDIA GTX series card in it. Um, the embedded options are great for a cheap solution. So, uh, it's like you have a set top box or maybe like a home office computer. Um, yeah. You just need something to play an mp4 video and that it's good yeah and i think these are getting better correct absolutely i mean for my macbook pro i do all my editing on there and there's no discrete graphics yes um that has the intel iris graphics which is kind of built onto the cpu so graphics on the processor is happening a lot um as you were just talking about your macbook has the intel iris graphics which is built onto the cpu um the ryzen processors have most of them have Vega graphics built onto the CPU, and that's just a brand of graphics that they offer, kind of an entry level. And those are getting amazing. I've been able to play the top Battle Royale game <laughs> running about 30 frames per second. So um, they're definitely there, and they can do some advanced stuff, and they're enough to get you going for a little while until mm -hmm. you get into some more complicated stuff. Yeah. So if you're, if you're working in Photoshop Premiere, 
or any of Adobe's products, or if you're working in Autodesk, CAD design, a uh, graphics card is gonna be super useful. Yeah. Um, if you are doing any kind of AI programming, yeah. um, yeah. machine learning, something that requires a very specialized or a perhaps highly parallel application, a dedicated graphics card can actually be a very useful tool to make you know testing and design very possible. Yeah, and also if you want to get into mining cryptocurrencies, they are much more efficient than just the, the normal processor. So the, the cost of graphics cards shot through the roof when cryptocurrency kind of became a thing. Yes, it was awful. Although there's like a different type of chip called ASICs, mm -hmm. at, which stands for Application Specific Integrated Circuit, which means it can do one thing very well and not much else. Yeah, so an example of this would be a card specifically for cryptocurrency mining or for video processing, yes. maybe? Yes, cryptocurrency mining is actually a great example. Um, they make like little flash drives which just contain an ASIC processor that your computer can talk to. Oh, cool. Like, hey, solve this, and it'll return the result. And um, it's just kind of a, a nice extension to your computer that only does what you want it to do. So if you feel there might be a card out there that could solve one of your problems, look into ASICs. There might be one out there that could improve the process of whatever you're you're working on so there is a few other parts to a computer but we're not really going to go into great detail because they don't really particularly fit this but they're very important nonetheless yeah. um, so you have the case the metal box that houses it all um, could have tempered glass rgb could look like a black box could be tinier than that i it's just they come in it could be open yeah there could be no box. There could be no box. I've, I've had computers on cardboard here. It's been a good time. <laughs> and we also talked about the motherboard. That kind of pieces everything together. And then other than that, there's the, the power supply, which runs everything. Yes, uh, there's the power supply, the DVD drive. Most of those are self-explanatory. I mean, we could talk about the motherboard a little bit more, but in summary, just, it connects everything. It connects RAM, it connects CPU. All Everything comes together on the... Um, the circuit highway of your motherboard. So the only thing I want to ask you is how do we know if a power supply is good and if it's going to serve the purpose for what we need it for? How do we know if it's good if it has someone's name on it? If it um, So if you're building a custom build, which often a lot of people do, get something that has someone's name on it and not just like genera power. <laughs> <laughs> Some reputable ones are EVGA, Corsair, and Thermaltake. Uh, anything with a two-year warranty plus is great. Um, how do you know if it's good for your application? Use a power supply calculator and that can be found at my go-to is Cooler Master Power Supply Calculator. Just Google that, you'll find it. Motherboard is kind of an after of the fact. So the first thing you want to do is like the specific application of my computer. I'm using it for AI programming, which means I want the highest processor I can. So I'm gonna get an AMD Threadripper, okay. which is like a very premium thing. So now I wanna find a motherboard that fits Threadripper. Now that I've picked out a motherboard, um, I'm in the right size, so there's like micro ATX, there's ATX, kind of a different sizes. I need to find a case that fits that. I need to find a power supply to fit that. If I'm gonna add a graphics card, I need to decide that now then decide power supply. Um, and the power supply, you would know which one to get because you already figured out all your other components. Yes. And then you just use that calculator. Yes, it's a very you go. very last thing. And then once you got all those, you know which case you need to get because you know how much space it's gonna take by the standard size. Mm -hmm. uh, a key thing for me, which took me a while to get, is like the CPU must match the motherboard and everything has to be the same generation. So an i3 from five years ago is not gonna fit, or is not gonna work it can't fit physically, but it's not going to electrically work in a board today. So they're not backwards compatible, the boards? No. So if you want to see us kind of go through this process a little bit more, we've actually put together a micro series on building a computer. So we talk about the, the parts, what they look like, how to put them in properly, maybe properly. I was the one who actually put them in and I don't really know what I'm doing. So he guided me through the process. And uh, that should be out on the channel fairly soon. So make sure you hit that sub button. And uh, that's, that's pretty much it. Any useful links will be in the description and leave a comment in the comment section below. Thank you, Josh. Yes. Any final words? Yes, it is super important for you to understand 
the hardware that your software is running on. I don't care if you're developing a tic-tac-toe application or a heart monitor super critical thing. Like you have to know what is my program running on? What are my limitations? So what, what can I design to and not above? Understanding that is gonna help you develop more effectively and create a better quality product in the end. Well, thank you. Peace out, guys. Peace.